Good morning, church. So for the uh, past several weeks, the rector search team has been reviewing dozens of sermons from applicants uh, and rigorously evaluating them on their quality. And let me tell you, it's a tough room. Um, I've even seen Catherine Barnes go Simon Cowell on a few sermons. So um, please forgive me if I seem a little nervous preaching in front of this group today. When I turned 16, my parents bought me my first car, and uh, this is a picture of it. Uh, It was old, slow, beige, and previously owned by a chain smoker. (laughs) But not only did it smell like an ashtray on the inside, it smoked so badly on the outside that my friends joked about my James Bond car because of the smoke screen that it left behind. Now, the car that I wanted was this tricked out 500 horsepower Camaro Z28 down the road that was for sale. Yep, that's 16 year old me. And uh, it was completely rusted out, but it was the fastest car in town. As you can see, it had a lightning bolt painted on the side to prove it. And so I saved every single penny that I made from my job at Little Caesars Pizza until I had just enough money to buy it for myself. In fact, when I uh, got the keys from the seller and pulled out onto the street, it was only then that I realized that I didn't have any money left over for gas, and the tank was completely empty. Uh, Later that year, I was giving a couple of buddies of mine a ride home from a high school Bible study, of all things, and after dropping off my first friend, who would go on to become a pastor in Flower Mound, Uh, My other friend, who would go on to become a police officer in Arlington, uh, looked over at me and said, now, show me what this thing can really do. Well, it wasn't long before I uh, blew past a police car at 96 miles per hour in a 30 mile per hour zone. And when I looked in my rearview mirror and I saw the officer doing a UE in the middle of the road with sirens and lights blaring, Uh, the thrill immediately turned to panic, and instead of pulling over, I fled. Yeah. Now, it was only two or three minutes before I came to my senses, but uh, I pulled over, got out of the car, and waited for the officer to catch up like this. I knew I was toast. Down at the station, as I picked up the phone to call my parents, I realized that they were at dinner their anniversary dinner. As soon as I picked, as soon as my dad picked up the phone, I bursted into tears. Uh, They had to cancel their plans to come bail out their oldest son. Happy anniversary. Uh, But my dad, uh, he didn't yell at me. He didn't even say a cross word to me. Uh, There were big fines to pay, and my dad sold my precious Camaro without even telling me I just came home from school one day and it was gone. But what could I say? I mean, uh, he, he had my good in mind. And in the end, my dad showed me justice and mercy, both at the same time, motivated by his love and a desire for my good. So I tell you the story as a picture of justice and mercy as exhibited by my father, But how does justice and mercy work with our Heavenly Father? That's the topic of today. And then we'll end with maybe a few ways that we can put these two virtues to practice in everyday life. So uh, this is a huge topic, justice, mercy, and love, perennial topics, right? I'm going to just try to focus on four takeaways. One, it's harder to reconcile mercy and justice than you may think. There's more to biblical mercy and justice than the popular notion of these terms. Love is central to a Christian understanding of these two. And the cross of Christ is ultimately where mercy and justice are harmonized. First, it's harder to reconcile mercy and justice than it may seem. Now, typically, when we think of God's attributes, uh, we we see them as an unbroken string of uh, complementary values. So in other words, we don't see any conflict between God's love, wisdom, eternality, his perfection, and so on. And in the ordinary course of living the Christian life, prayer, worship, Bible study, we think it's obvious that God is both 
merciful and just. So what's the problem? Uh, Exodus 34, uh, this is where God passes before Moses on Mount Sinai, and he proclaims about himself, the Lord, the Lord, a God merciful and gracious, slow to anger, and abounding in steadfast love, forgiving iniquity, transgression, and sin, but who will by no means clear the guilty. Here God describes himself as merciful, gracious, forgiving, but will by no means clear the guilty. So God is merciful and just, case closed, right? But uh, upon deeper reflection of a verse like this, you, you have to ask, how does that work, though? It's not so easy. In our Old Testament reading from this morning, we have in Jonah, uh, another idiot who, instead of a Camaro, uses a ship to flee his pursuer. And by the way, thank you, Morgan, for an unbelievable reading of that. I felt like I was listening to an audio book or something this morning. Um, but yeah, he's trying to flee God. And for those of you who remember the last time I was able to preach, uh, this is a story that starts with a downward ascent. God tells Jonah to arise and go to Nineveh, but instead Jonah flees by going down to Joppa to hide down in the bottom of a ship, down into the depths of the sea, and down into the belly of the well until he repents, is thrust up and out into the light of God's will to preach repentance and salvation to Nineveh. As Morgan read, though, however, when Nineveh actually repents, does the very thing that, Joseph, uh, that Jonah preached to them, he gets upset, essentially pitting God's mercy and justice against each other. And God asks Jonah, are you right to be so angry? Now, on one hand, we read something like this and think Jonah is crazy for getting upset over God being merciful. But isn't this just like us, though? We want mercy for ourselves, but justice for everyone else, especially our enemies. And uh, Jonah is the Old Testament equivalent to the hypocritical, unmerciful servant that Father Rosebery uh, preached about last week. And so Jonah, he's upset. He makes this roughshod shelter out on the edge of town in protest where he can be miserable and let everyone know about it. Perhaps the earliest recorded case of virtue signaling. And at this point... God would have been just to just let Jonah sit there and sulk in his hypocrisy, maybe even punish him, but instead God shows mercy, causing a shade tree to grow and to shield Jonah from the elements while he pouts. But God's mercy is not merely passive. He doesn't just sweep things under the rug because it's easier than dealing with the mess. God's mercy is active. It's even creative. It's intentional. It's instructive. It's mercy intended to bring the wayward Jonah back into alignment with his love and goodness. So God sends a worm to destroy the tree and a scorching east wind so that the sun beats down on Jonah's head. But like God's mercy, this isn't easy justice either. It's not just mere payback. God is trying to teach Jonah something. So God repeats his question. Are you sure it is right for you to be so angry? When you were a kid, did your parents ever ask you rhetorical questions? <laughs> Do you think I'm stupid? <laughs> As a child, you might not have known what the word rhetorical meant, but you knew. Do not answer that question. <laughs> but Jonah, he answers. Yes, I'm right to be angry. In fact... I'm so angry I could die. I mean, this reminds me, he's like a child. So God takes Jonah to the proverbial woodshed at this point, reminding him, you fled from my presence until you finally begged for mercy in the belly of a well, and I saved you. And then you come right back into my presence, demanding justice against Nineveh after they repent. Basically, what's wrong with you? But this time, Jonah seems to understand that's a rhetorical question, and the book ends in silence. So if we learn anything from this story today, it's that even people who are well acquainted with both God's mercy and justice 
still get these two things twisted from time to time. So another reason sorting all of this out can be difficult is that there's more to the biblical concept of mercy and justice than just the normal, everyday version of it. For some, this idea of God's mercy and justice is so problematic that it's even cited as an argument against the central claims of Christianity. Dan Barker, a former evangelical preacher turned atheist, explains in his book, justice means that punishment is administered with the exact amount of severity that is deserved for the crime that is committed. We don't put children in prison for stealing cookies, and we don't merely fine murderers $50. Mercy, on the other hand, means that punishment is administered with less severity than deserved. And so, if God is infinitely merciful, he can't be just. And if God is ever just, not to mention infinitely just, then he cannot be infinitely merciful. A God who is both infinitely merciful and just not only does not exist, he cannot exist. Now, on the surface, Barker seems to have a point here. For him, an infinitely just and an infinitely merciful God is not just a contrast, but a blatant contradiction. This is a married bachelor or a four-sided circle. It just doesn't make sense. Now, it's important to note here that even though we can empathize with Barker's claim, it's not as if he's offered an atheistic solution to the problem. Since he's defined justice and mercy in mere terms of justice, or sorry, of punishment deserved, A world that runs on nothing but justice, this kind of justice, would be severe and leave no room for forgiveness. And a world that runs on nothing but mercy, well, that would lead to anarchy and chaos. And so this is a topic that everyone has to deal with, no matter what your creed is. Isaiah 30 says, The Lord longs to be gracious to you, and therefore he waits on high to have mercy on you. For the Lord is a God of justice. Did you catch that? Because it's really subtle. It's really easy to miss. If we only understand justice and mercy on Barker's terms as terms of punishment deserve, this verse makes no sense whatsoever. This verse basically asks, how do we know that God is gracious and merciful? And without skipping a beat, the answer is apparently, for the Lord is a God of justice. This seems a lot like saying, how do we know the sky is blue? because it is red. That doesn't make sense. And this is exactly what Barker is getting at. And so it seems like we can either say, A, biblical authors weren't very smart and that they didn't really think deeply about mercy and justice despite writing a whole lot about it. Or maybe there's something more to biblical justice and mercy, more than just mere punishment or getting what you deserve. So let's look a little closer and see if we can't get behind this kind of rather thin understanding of mercy and justice to a more uh, biblical notion of the terms. Listen to what the great theologian philosopher Thomas Aquinas had to say about this, writing in the 13th century. Objection to. Some say mercy is a relaxation of justice, but God cannot cancel out his uh, or contradict his justice. So it is unfitting to attribute mercy to God. This is Barker's exact objection. And Aquinas replies, God acts mercifully, not by going against his justice, but by doing something more than justice. Thus, a man who pays another $200, and you'll see parallels to the New Testament reading here, a man who pays $200, though owing $100, does nothing against justice, but acts generously or mercifully. The same is true with the one who pardons an offense committed against him. For by forgiving, it may be said that he is bestowing a gift. This is why the Apostle Paul says, forgive one another as Christ has forgiven you, Ephesians 4. So it is clear that mercy does not destroy justice, but in this sense is the fullness thereof. And thus the scriptures tell us, mercy triumphs over justice or judgment, James 2. It's almost as if really smart people in the church anticipated Barker's objection 800 years ago. Punishment, pardon, reward, getting what you deserve or rendering what is owed. All these things are part of justice and mercy, but 
Again, the biblical notion is much richer than any single aspect on its own. Let's consider the fact that mercy doesn't even make sense without justice. Because we have to ask, why do we need mercy in the first place? Well, because something went wrong. Something needs to be corrected. Something needs to be justified. So in some sense, mercy depends on justice. Then again, without God's merciful act of creating and continually sustaining every atom in our being, we could never even be recipients of God's justice because we wouldn't even exist. So in some way, justice depends on mercy. And we have a real chicken and egg scenario here. But the point is, is that mercy and justice somehow work together. What else do the scriptures say about mercy and justice? Psalms 146 says, Blessed is he whose hope is in the Lord his God, who ex executes justice for the oppressed, who gives food to the hungry. This psalm goes on to promise God's justice to the prisoner, the blind, the orphan, and other hardships. But isn't this an interesting list? It's not clear that most of these hardships have anything to do with justice. That is, if we're only looking at it in terms of the exact right amount of punishment deserved. Because what crime needs to be punished in the one who hungers, the one who is blind or the orphan? Over and over, Scripture tells us that justice is more of a means of restoring proper order, the setting right of all that has gone wrong in the world. Not just for the morally wicked, the thief, the liar, the fugitive of justice, but for the broken, the fatherless, the wounded, weak, needy, and poor. The Bible also links and even equates justice with righteousness. And so it's no coincidence that justice and justification have the same root. When God justifies the sinner, our relationship is made right with him. We are aligned, put in order, brought into communion with our maker. And so at the most basic level, but biblical justice is really about establishing or reestablishing what is right, true, good, and beautiful in a broken world. In some mysterious way, God's justice is merciful and his mercy is just. They're two sides of the same coin. But what binds them together? How are they exercised in the right way? Well, that leads us to our next point, that love is central to a Christian understanding of mercy and justice. It might be easy to understand how love and mercy are connected, but what about love and justice? Well, first, what is love? Another huge topic, right? 1 John 4, 8 tells us that anyone who does not love does not know God because God is love. Now, love might be the most misused word on the planet, so maybe we should stop there for a second and talk about what does it mean for God to be love. Let me offer a definition that's been kind of cobbled together from various theologians who lived long before love was uh, kind of just thought of as a romantic feeling. And I've broken it down here so that maybe it'll help us because it is a bit complex, right? To will, choose, and share in the good of the beloved for the beloved's own sake. And we can see this definition illustrated in a very, very well-known verse like Romans 5.8. God demonstrates his love for us in that even while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. So if we're going to kind of unpack this, God wills, in other words, he wants to share his love with us because he is love. God chooses. It's not enough to just want or to wish good things for others. Real love demands action. And so God demonstrates his love. He chooses to love us even though we did not choose him. God shares in his love. He doesn't just mail in a charitable donation so he doesn't have to deal with it anymore and go about his business. No, 
This is what Jesus talks about as a hen gathers her chicks. So God wants to reconcile us to himself in Christ. And so God condescends to our level. He becomes like us to share in a relationship. He is Emmanuel, God with us. And lastly, for the sake of the beloved. As harsh as it is to our modern ears, one of the most important things we can understand about God is that he doesn't need us. He wasn't lonely. He wasn't peering into the pet store window longing for a puppy to fill the human-shaped hole in his heart, right? He is love itself expressed perfectly among the three co-eternal persons of the Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. But the fact that God doesn't need us shouldn't discourage us. Quite the contrary, this means that God's love for us is an utterly gratuitous gift. He offers us his love for our sake, not for his. He is complete and supremely glorious with or without us. And yet Christ died for us. You'll notice that there's no mention of feelings in this definition. And it's true, love is not a feeling, but human love does include feelings. If I will choose and share my love in a cold and rational way with no feelings, this is not how humans love. So why are feelings not a factor in God's love? Now, to some degree, feelings are not completely under our control. Feelings change. We're moved by them. They are in some sense inflicted upon us sometimes. And like Jonah, our mood swings from happy to sad based on the weather. But God can't be like that. God is love. And so he doesn't fall in love or out of love like we do for the same reason that the ocean can't get any wetter. He is infinite love. When we tell people you have so much potential, we mean this as a compliment, but this kind of language doesn't even apply with God because there is no potential left in him. As an unchanging, infinite being, every good thing about God, including his love, is always fully activated, actualized. So love, as it is found in God, it's not a feeling. It's, it's something much bigger, much deeper. Now, some might worry that a changeless God who loves without increase or decrease sounds more like a statue uh, and less like the God of the Bible. Um, but let me share a, a different analogy with you that one of my seminary professors helped me with a long time ago, and it's been very helpful for me. Picture God's love more like, like a forceful wind, always blowing with the same ferocity, always in the same direction. In this analogy, we play the role of the ship at sea. And when we sail against the wind of God's love, as it were with Jonah, uh, running away from God's will for our lives, we experience what seems to us to be the violent anger, sadness, or jealousy of God as his steadfast and merciful love rips our sails to shreds. What we struggle to see from our limited perspective is that the wind is not actually cruel or random or indifferent. It's actually instructive. It beckons for us to align the rudder to the wind. And when we do, the same wind that once felt like it would tear us to pieces begins to fill our sails and propels us forward. Again, from our earthly perspective, this change seems like to us like God's mood changed, but in reality, it's our course that has changed. And now we feel what has always been the love, joy, and delight of God as we move along with him in the unchanging direction that he's always flowed. As it is with his love, God's justice and mercy can sometimes, to us, feel like his correction one day and his grace the next. But what we experience on this side of eternity is actually the continuous flow of God's love for us, ever in the same direction, training us, pointing us, wooing us towards the good, which is himself. One final takeaway is something that I've already hinted at, and that's 
that the cross of Christ is ultimately where mercy and justice are harmonized. Psalm 85 says that mercy and truth have met together. Righteousness or justice and peace have kissed. Truth shall spring out of the earth and righteousness shall look down from heaven. If you look at this verse in reverse, see if you don't recognize a familiar story. Righteousness comes down from heaven. Truth comes up from the earth. Mercy and justice have kissed or met together. This is a stunning messianic prophecy and a beautiful picture of Christ, the God-man, in whom mercy and justice have ultimately been reconciled. Have you ever wondered why God chose to save us like this? That is, through his, his son's death on a cross? Because it seems like the one who said, let there be light, could just as easily have said, you know, the sins of the world are forgiven. Why go through all the trouble? In John 10, Jesus says that no one took his life from him, that he laid it down. And so if Jesus didn't have to choose the cross, why would he do something like that? This is a very complex question, but let me suggest to you that at least part of the answer flows out of God's mercy and justice. God does not merely wave away our sins because man's sin causes untold suffering and death, our own and around the world. And so there would be something unfitting about just waving away something so grievous. Instead, Christ pays for man's sin through his own suffering and death as the God-man. Our debt is paid in full, and so the cross fits with God's justice. The cross also fits with God's mercy because we owed a debt that we, could, we couldn't possibly have paid. And so Christ, when he pays the debt for us on the cross, he does so out of his great love and mercy. The cross is God's great demonstration to us that mercy is not opposed to justice. The two are not contraries. Mercy doesn't contradict justice. It fulfills it and surpasses it. Both are grounded and motivated by God's great love for us that seeks to reconcile us to himself. In closing, practically speaking, how can, we better be, how can we be better agents of both mercy and justice in the world? And here we'll also look to Jesus. In John 8, Jesus comes to the aid of the woman caught in the act of adultery, which is the scene you see in the painting here. He famously tells her bloodthirsty accusers, he who is without sin cast the first stone. And then he bends down and writes something in the sand that causes them all to walk away, cut to the heart with conviction. And then Jesus turns to the woman and he says that he doesn't condemn her and to go and sin no more. And so what we have here is a concise master class on how to be agents of mercy and justice in the world. Jesus defends the woman. He forgives her. And then that's not where it ends. He points her towards justice, towards aligning herself with God's love and goodness. Notice that the proud Pharisees, when they encounter the love of Jesus, he rips their cells to shreds. But when the same love meets the humility of a broken woman, her life already in shreds, she lets go of the rudder that has brought her to where she is, and then she is filled and lifted and sent. One final observation our tendency is to read a story like this and see ourselves only in the role of the woman. And in our most presumptuous moments, we might even think of ourselves in the role of Christ, who comes to the woman's defense and restores the broken. But it seems to me that everyone reads this story and thinks, take that, Pharisees, because it's never even occurred to us that uh, we may have more in common with the self-righteous mob that was ready to stone this woman because all we're concerned about is exact punishment and not restoration. And so biblical mercy and justice are not in conflict. 
but they are in some sort of beautiful dance between two complementary partners that move in unison to the song of God's love. What does the Lord require? To do justice, love mercy, and to walk humbly with our God. Dear Lord, I pray that um, your spirit would prick our hearts and teach us how to be agents of mercy and justice in the world. We pray in Jesus' name, amen.